Hey, this is The Fight Nerd, and today I am honored to be joined by a living legend in mixed martial arts who needs no introduction whatsoever, Mr. Ken Shamrock. Ken, how's it going today? I'm doing well, and yourself? I'm good, thank you. Now, there, there's so much I want to talk to you about today, but first things first, you've got a fight coming up. You're getting ready for a match against Pedro Hizo in a few weeks at Impact FC 2 in Australia. Now, what are you doing to prepare for this match? Uh, lots of training. <laughs> Smart training, you know, as you get older, uh, your body doesn't recover as much, so you have to pay attention on how much training you're doing. Are you doing enough or not enough? Um, you know, you're going into training, are you tired? Are you recovering fast enough? So there's a lot of stuff you have to figure out, um, especially being at my age and still wanting to stay in the fight game. Um, you have to be smart about the training and figuring out how much time it takes you to recover from a hard training and when you're going to do it again. Now, uh, what is the game plan going into this match against Hizo? Uh, well, you know, I mean, just like anything else, it's MMA. So you've got to be well-rounded in every aspect um, of this uh, sport, which is the ground, the clinch, the kicks, the punches, the knees, and the elbows. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of stuff that you have to prepare for, and you have to be well-rounded in all of it. Um, so for me, the most important thing is to make sure that he respects my stand-up. He's got to respect my stand-up in order for me to have anything else work. Are you worried at all about Hizzo's hands? Because he's very well known for his hands and also his ability to take a punch. Yeah, you know, I mean, um, it's a fight, you know, and then you look at the guy's strengths and his weaknesses. Uh, Pedro Hizzo has made a living at being able to get up off his back and knock people out. Um, but he's also um, been his weakness. That's been his Achilles heels is he hasn't been a well-rounded fighter, um, which has gotten him into trouble lately, not being able to, um, you know, fight off his back. Um, not being able to you know, keep guys from getting inside on him and being able to throw that hook. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that, that uh, people have, over the years, when you fight for a long time, that people pick apart and they find weaknesses. Um, I don't believe that Pedro, um, over the years, um, has improved on his game. I think he's kind of just stayed the same. And when you do that, um, you know, everybody's going to get better, but he's going to be changing with the sport and getting better with the sport. I know I have. I know I've really, really improved on my stand-up um, and really made that more of a focus because on the ground, I know what I can do on the ground. Um, my stand-up um, definitely um, at times has been questionable. So I've really practiced and really, really, really studied that stand-up footwork and angles and punch combinations and kicks and stuff. So that way, my takedowns become easier, my submissions become easier because now they have to respect me when I'm on my feet. Now, your last fight before this match was against the late Ross Clifton almost 18 months ago in California. Is there going to be any ring rust coming into this with such a long layoff? Oh, I'm sure there is. Um, you know, I mean, I've tried to, as much as you can in training, to, you know, put yourself in a, in a mode and also in a situation um, so that you go into that ring and that you understand what it is that you have to do. Um, but at the same time, it's not the same thing as getting in front of the crowd, getting in front of the media preparing for the fight, um, you know, all those things that lead up uh, to getting inside that cage and fighting on a big, big event like this. So obviously, you know, when you take that much time off, you're going to have a little bit of a stutter in your step. But, um, you know, I've been here before. I know what to expect. It's not like I haven't taken time off before several times. And uh, so I know what to expect. It's not like I don't know what to expect. Sorry, it's not Ken Shamrock's first time at the rodeo. Absolutely not. Now, at your last fight, the California State Athletic Commission uh, fined and suspended you for a year after they discovered three banned substances in your system, which you said were from legal products. Now, California has had issues before with other fighters, including Sean Shirk. So what do you think is going on with the CSAC that they seem to be constantly having these issues while other commissions don't? Well, it, it just seems to me like um, they need to clean house. Um, it seems like they're always changing uh, commissions. Um, they're... they're their office is in a scramble right now. No, you, no one knows who's running what. Um, their tests and their um, organization, I guess, is um, definitely up in the air. You, uh, you don't know sometimes. Like, for instance, mine, my, my, uh, my, stu my test didn't come back until three and a half weeks after the event. I've been fighting in MMA since the beginning of this, and I have never in my entire career ever heard of a test coming back three and a half weeks later and it was right after I signed the fight
fight, um, to fight a, a, an event in, in Miami uh, against uh, Bobby Lackley, did I not find out that my test at that time was dirty? I never knew anything until after that contract was signed. And then all of a sudden I get this notice two days later that I was dirty. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. And to this day, I've never had a court date. No, nothing at all? No, they haven't sent you any response or anything in regards to appealing nope, it? Nothing, nothing. All right, now, you recently went on Fighting Words with Mike Straka on HDNet, where you admitted to previous steroid use and talked about the usage of it in mixed martial arts. Uh, and you stated that fans are part of the problem. Now, I wanted to ask, at, at the end of the day, you're the fighter in the cage, and the fans are the one watching from home, so... Do you think that it's right to point fingers at the fans, or is it more so the responsibility of the fighter to have a greater mindset to overcome things like that? Yeah, I'm sorry if that's the way it came off to, to point fingers at the fans, because that's not what I was doing. Um, what I was doing was making awareness of people understanding their sports. When you get into a, a situation like baseball or basketball or football, boxing, and you see a guy come out of college, and you see how much he grows, and how big he gets. And I'm not saying the average fan. I'm not talking about the person that sits home and watches the game, because they really, they're just watching and they're being entertained. I'm talking about from the media, I'm talking about from the sports writers, I'm talking about from the hardcore fans, who hear all the rumbles behind the scenes, who know all the stuff that's going on, and they stick their head in the sand, like it does. Like, and then they're shocked when, it, when, when this stuff comes out. I'm not saying that it's not the athlete's responsibility at all. No way. But what I'm saying is when something like that comes out and then you have people going, oh my God, I can't believe he was doing that. That, to me, is wrong. Because, to me, most likely, and I'm not saying in all cases, but most likely people know what's going on. So it's more so that people are just turning a blind eye to it then suddenly pointing fingers afterwards. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it's the responsibility of the fans, because it's not. I mean, they're watching the thing, and they're having fun, and they're all enjoying it, and there's absolutely no responsibility on them. It's the athlete and the reporters. They don't even have a responsibility on this at all. But by no means do when somebody comes up dirty and you have an idea about what's going on and you never stepped up and said anything, do you jump on the bandwagon and be a part of that program? Because that's what happens. There's guys that don't want to take a stand on it because they're afraid that they might piss somebody off. But then once somebody else takes a stand on it and goes, you know what, that's wrong, we're going to test, they start testing, they catch a few people, they start going after them. Then these other people who knew all along what was going on start jumping on that side because now it's politically correct. Now, you also mentioned how you think steroids should be legalized. Now, um, how would that affect... No, you? That's, oh. that's, that was definitely that was taken out of context. Okay. I do not, and absolutely not believe that steroids should be legal. My intention on that whole conversation was I thought that steroids should be controlled, controlled, not legalized, because I said even in the statement that if you allow it to be legal, people are going to get bigger, faster, stronger, and somebody's going to get hurt. Okay, now how do you propose to control steroids then in sports? The same way they do it now. They test levels in the body. There's levels that are extremely high, that are very unsafe for an athlete, and then there's levels in the body that are extremely safe and that help recovery and in injuries. So if you're going to go ahead and test the levels in, a, in an athlete's body, then you can go ahead and test the levels in an athlete's body, which is safe, which is good for recovery, which is good for their health, which is good for their living. They're not going to be coming out of this sport all beat up and not being able to walk or, or not being able to think. You know, they're going to be able to recover and be healthy, be rejuvenated. thing called age management, uh, which is a big thing in the society right now, uh, which helps your, your, um, your test levels in your body and your HCG levels in your body and your HGH levels in your body to come back up to a healthy level so your body can recover, you can feel alive again, your body feels good. These are things that are safe, medically proven that are safe to help you have a healthier and a better life after the age of 50 or 60. I guess a lot of fans just don't really understand the term steroid and how many different uses that it has. You know, it's not just necessarily uh, the kind of thing that makes your muscles get huge, right? No, you know, and that's, that's why when I talk about, you know, being controlled in a controlled environment, you don't, there's certain things that you do 
not allowing this into the sports because it's not healthy. And a lot of these kids who are coming in and they're hearing about these guys that are playing baseball and the guys that are playing football and basketball and boxing and in MMA, and they see these guys and they're having success, then once they get to a certain point where they feel like, you know what, I need that extra oomph, and they start going out and doing it, but then they're uneducated about what it is they're getting. I'm not too sure what Australia has in terms of regulations, and, and don't take this as a subtle accusation at all, it's not my intent here, uh, but what is Impact FC doing in regards to drug testing for their events? Oh, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, I have no idea. Um, I, that's stuff I don't get into. If I just go and I do whatever they ask me to do. Okay, fair enough. Uh, now, I want to ask you about a match from way back when in the far distant year of 1996.